Dr. Medlock, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I want to begin by just commenting on the uh, on the state of of the regulatory infrastructure that we have in our natural gas industry in this in this country and bro more broadly North America. Um, you know, beginning with the Natural Gas Act in, 19, in the late 1970s, uh, followed by uh, several FERC orders that were passed up through the 90s, we've basically seen the establishment of a market which arguably is the most efficient market in the world. Um, and basically the, the, the reason we can say that is because any consumer that needs or, or, or has a desire to get natural gas at any given point in time, any producer that has a desire to actually access a market, uh, the ability is there. Uh, this is largely a result of the regulatory infrastructure that's put, been put in place. It encourages competition, it encourages entrepreneurship, and it's basically been the reason why in this country we've seen, as, been, as, is, as it's been called already in this, in, in this hearing, the shale gale uh, emerge in this country. So anything that sort of uh, uh, could, could stand to disrupt this very well-functioning market, I think, would be a detriment to the country and to the natural gas industry. Um, it was also referenced that, uh, you know, in, in terms of the uh, number of uh, licenses that have been applied for, we're talking in excess of 30 billion cubic feet a day at this point, and it's, a, it's quite a large number. Um, but one thing you have to, to do is take a step back and realize the context in which that, that, that volume, that potential volume sits. Namely, the global liquefied natural gas market today is just over 30 billion cubic feet a day. There is no way that if all of those licenses were approved, you'd see 30 BCF a day of capacity constructed in this country. Um, you're basically talking about doubling the size of the LNG market. So you have to understand and you have to take into the proper context you know, the kind of competition that you're seeing. It's a race to win first mover advantage. It's exactly what you would expect to see in a competitive market. Now, when we sort of step sort of beyond what's happened with regard to uh, uh, natural gas and shale gas development in this country. Um, we can think about national security issues, which have been also referenced. And as a matter of fact, we, we performed a study for the international, uh, the Office of International Policy and Affairs for the DOE a little over, uh, about two years ago now, um, where we looked at the broader geopolitical implications of shale. Uh, and this is a mouthful, and I'm happy to expand in, 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 in Q&A. Um, but there were three countries in particular that were most affected by the emergence of shale in North America. Um, and when you think again about foreign policy objectives of this country, not only in the short term, but even in the medium to long term, uh, this is a mouthful. Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. Those are the three countries that, most, that were most heavily impacted by shale developments in this country. You take shale out of the mix and those three countries really stand to benefit in a very dramatic way because of their massive natural gas resources and hydrocarbon resources more generally. Um, Moving beyond that, um, when we think about a lot of the things that a lot of people have been talking about with regard to gas and to transportation, there's a real uh, potential here for natural gas to displace some oil in our transportation infrastructure. And I think that's a really uh, a very important point when we think about national security. Um, however, there still exist challenges. Um, Moving gas into high-use vehicles, uh, into fleet systems, this is something that already stands to benefit a lot of companies that own and operate these kinds of fleets, like FedEx, UPS. Uh, you're even talking about now LNG into long-haul trucking. So these sorts of applications are already beginning to occur, not because of policy, but because the commercial incentive is there. It's there right now. And so you're starting to see that migration occur. Moving into the cars that you and I drive, that's going to be a little bit more challenging because you're not talking about vehicles that are driven in excess of 20,000 miles a year. You're talking about vehicles that are driven 12 to 13,000 miles a year, and that matters a tremendous amount when you talk about fuel choice and the kinds of uh, capital costs individuals are willing to incur when they buy new vehicles. Uh, on the emissions front, um, there are studies ongoing with regard to natural gas throughout the value chain and what methane leakage might mean for the real potential uh, that might be there associated with natural gas uh, uh, developments. And one of the things, and uh, one of the studies that's actually ongoing, I'm actually very much looking forward to seeing the results of, is one that's being conducted by the Environmental Defense Fund. They're looking at, they're, they're measuring methane leakage not only at the wellhead, but also all the way down to the end use. 
Um, one of the things that I fully expect to see as a result of that study, because it's something that I've actually looked at a little bit in my past, is that what you'll see is a, the most egregious source of methane leakage is what we call, in, in locations in the market, what we call behind the fence. So this is after local distribution companies take charge of the gas. And that opens up a tremendous amount of discussion around the appropriate policies for how maintenance is performed on systems, not just interstate systems, not just gathering systems, but even behind the fence systems, so local distribution companies. Um, finally, uh, uh, on the environmental front, when we talk about uh, the potential for natural gas to reduce um, uh, or achieve certain climate change objectives, uh, emissions objectives. I think we've already seen to some extent, uh, just in 2012, the preliminary data, what can actually happen if gas can displace older coal facilities from the, from the generation stack, when we're talking about power generation in particular. Uh, what we actually saw is that in 2012, because of the low price of natural gas, uh, natural gas actually rose to surpass coal's share in generation for some period of the year. What that basically resulted in was CO2 emissions being as low in this country as they have been since 1990. That's pretty remarkable. What that tells you is that natural gas stands to benefit not only domestic manufacturing, not only domestic producers to the extent that LNG exports actually do occur uh, under a market equilibrium, um, and I think that's an important point. But it also stands to benefit various environmental objecti objectives. Uh, uh, and, and again, if we're going to think about appropriate policies, I think the first thing we need to do is gather more information, which is why I applaud hearings like this and the kinds of things that we're seeing go on, not only academic, but in the industrial communities as well. Thank you. Well, well 